Hello, hello everyone. I'm Dr. Neha Narula, family physician here at Stanford Healthcare. And I'm Dr. Olga Goldberg, a comprehensive neurologist at Stanford. Thank you so much on joining us today for this educational collaboration between the Department of Neurology and Department of Primary Care, made possible by the Value-Based Care Program. Our goal in these talks is to take a deeper dive into the most common neurologic complaints that we see in primary care and present the latest evidence-based pointers that you can use in your own practice. Today, joining us will be Dr. Lisa Smirnoff from our headache division, who will give us her expert advice on hormonal contraception in patients with migraine. Welcome, Lisa. Thanks so much for having me. Hormonal contraception has been a complex topic in the management of migraine, and we're consulted about this all the time. So I'm really glad we get to talk about it today. Yes, same here. This comes up so frequently in our practice. And most of us always think back to the board prep questions where birth control, migraine, strict no-no. So let's dig in. Is birth control safe in patients with migraine? And do we really need to avoid all oral contraception in patients that come in with migraine headaches? Historically, when we talk about using oral contraception, in patients with migraine, the concern that I always hear about from primary care providers is increased stroke risk. Lisa, can you tell us more about this concern, where it comes from, and is it still something that we should worry about? It's a great question. So we do know that there's a known association between migraine and stroke risk. However, that risk is very low, much lower than, say, diabetes or smoking. So the question then really becomes whether that risk is compounded if patients will also take oral contraceptives. In a review of studies with a history of migraine without aura, the increase in relative risk with oral contraceptives was about 1.8. While that's slightly higher, the difference is really minimal. Additionally, it is also important to know that for women who are over 45 with migraine, oral contraceptive use is no longer associated with increased stroke risk. So the bottom line is that the evidence for avoiding oral contraceptives in patients with migraine without aura is not compelling. Hmm, very interesting. Um, although the risk is minimal, I have to ask for patients that have other risk factors for stroke and would still like to continue to use oral contraceptive, what else can we do to further reduce this risk? So I think it's really important to note that a lot of the older studies we have really focused on previous guidelines that were looking at doses of estrogen used in early to mid-1900s, which were typically high, so around 150 micrograms per pill. Today, these doses are much lower. Nowadays, they're prescribed at about 20 to 30 micrograms and sometimes even lower. Although there's still a higher risk for stroke for high-dose birth control, which is currently 50 micrograms or higher, lower-dose birth control with estrogen content below 50 micrograms carries little to no stroke risk. So for practical purposes, patients with migraine should not be kept from taking oral contraceptives, especially the low estrogen formulations. Okay, great. I'm actually relieved to hear that the risk is lower than we've traditionally been led to believe. But I do wonder about patients who have aura with their migraines. Is it similar in this group as well? So unlike in our migraineurs without aura, stroke risk continued to be increased after the age of 45 in patients with migraine with aura. Oral contraceptives do increase the stroke risk by about a factor of two, so kind of in simpler terms, that comes out to about one ischemic stroke in a thousand women who stayed on low-dose oral contraceptives for five years. It's also important to keep in mind that although that risk is not negligible, we have to weigh it against the reasons why our patients want to use birth control to begin with, as well as their personal consequences of not being on birth control. Whether to use birth control or not should ultimately be an individualized decision and discussion with each patient. That makes total sense, and I'm so glad that you you um, stated that. Um, what do you both recommend for patients who want contraception, but after understanding the risk, choose not to go for combined oral contraceptives? Exactly. So in the case that progestin-only or non-hormonal options may really be the best. On the other hand, if oral contraceptives work well for the patient and help with their other menstrual symptoms, low-dose estrogen formulations may still be the best option. It's important 
takeaway to have a discussion of the risks and benefits with each patient. Our slide shows a list of low estrogen oral contraceptives that could be safer to use in patients with migraine. Ah, this looks great. This is definitely one that I'm saving. Um, and it's so helpful to know examples, like specific examples of what our neurology colleagues are recommending these days. Coming to the next point, I wanted to mention that in some of our patients, hormonal contraceptives can actually help with their migraines. I've actually heard that too. But then also on the other hand, some of my patients say that their migraines get worse around their periods and that their birth control isn't really helping. What do you recommend in that situation? That's a great point. Oftentimes the withdrawal of estrogen can actually trigger migraines. So when oral contraceptives are taken with the placebo week, they won't help. However, oral contraceptives when taken continually, skipping the placebo, weak or using continuous brands can actually prevent the drop in estrogen and therefore the headache associated with it. Ah, that's helpful. And what about IUDs? Are they known to help reduce migraine burden? That's a really tricky question. Since the Mirena and other hormonal IUDs can only, only include progesterone, estrogen levels continue to fluctuate throughout the cycle. So for some patients, this can help their migraines, but for others, it can actually make them worse. In general, though, progesterone-only methods do not affect migraines for most patients. Okay, that makes sense. And lastly, um, I have to ask, any suggestions for our perimenopausal patients with migraine? There's a large spectrum of perimenopausal symptoms caused by the shift in hormones, which can affect migraine triggers such as lack of sleep. So for this group of patients, especially those with a history of menstrual migraine, Continuous hormonal therapy during menopause can help alleviate migraine, which otherwise would increase in frequency during this time. Interesting. Lots of wonderful pointers today. Thank you so much, Lisa, for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. And thank you to our viewers. We hope that you can continue joining us as we explore other topics in neurology. Till next time. Bye.